It's a, it, we have these copies of reflections. If anyone doesn't have one or would like an extra one, um, Dennis, uh, we're just, we're passing them out. I think he has them here. It's a, just a monthly teaching letter that I use to kind of encourage and equip people. And it's a very attractive piece, so it's definitely divine to be a, a, something you read physically. There's something to be said for that, especially when we get such a in, digital influx. It's nice to have something that's more or less along the lines of uh, what uh, enforces the physicality, because the biblical vision of life is the most incarnational of all worldviews. There's nothing like it. It's the ultimate incarnational thing and the senses matter and how what you do matters the material things you do matter and that's really one of these themes we've been looking at uh, in this care category of what we're describing as wisdom because as you know since we've been meeting and Dennis when did we actually start this study three years ago has it been that long three years yeah. has it been that three? Yeah, flat, it really does um, that said, we've been always been doing this being, knowing, and doing series, as you know, um, but we're looking uh, at a lot of areas, and we've now zoomed down, starting with really with, with, with relationships, and then uh, this whole area of uh, marriage and parenting, work and stewardship, we've been through these, and now we're in the spiritual life, as you can see, and so looking at that more specifically, as you know, we did this series on the spiritual renewal cards. What does it mean to uh, read the scriptures and talk to God and to pray scripture back to God and to meditate and to understand those matters? And having a formal time, then, it's what's often called, as you know, a quiet time. Whereas what we often fail to do, though, is even if a person does have a, a regular quiet time, a regular time for prayer and study, what do they do the rest of the time? What do they do the rest of the day, which is a good deal of their day? In fact, almost everything, is it not? Why is it that people rarely actually connect the relationship with Christ to specific things we do throughout the course of the day? And that's what it means to be practicing his presence. And so that's a theme that's uh, really been um, understood too little by the church and applied too little because actually the expectation of Scripture is that you rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, that you walk by the Spirit, that you abide in Christ, that you set your mind in the things above. Whatever you do in word or deed, you do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to Him to God the Father. Are these not all ongoing practices? And largely speaking, they have not been connected. And that's why I say that the so-called um, temporal, the, the secular, becomes spiritual when the focus of your heart is the eternal. So that what ordinary things that you do, I don't care how mundane, how routine, how ordinary it is, all things matter. And so we are in a context and where we eliminate, eschew this false dichotomy between the sacred and the secular, you see. But rather, everything becomes spiritual when the focus of your heart is the eternal. So everything matters today that you do. Every, and every person, no little people, no little times, no little places, no little events. Everything matters that you do. And so that's been a theme. And then nine marks of a disciple, and we went through that process, a, an extensive series there. And now we're talking about a life of wisdom. And in this theme of wisdom, um, I have a wisdom series outline that I'm actually doing on my Sunday morning study. And I think uh, I've pointed this out to you on the Kenbo.org website, though. Under weekly studies, if you go to Sunday morning study, that's where you'll see the archive. Right now, I'm up to the book of Job. So I've been actually uh, moving through that material. And as you know, with this, with this, if you just go to that, there's actually a one-page summary and then the video. And so given that, then, we did an over introduction to wisdom. That's what I'm doing right now with you. I'm kind of truncating that series. This is a long series that I'm doing. I don't know how, many, how long it'll be, but it's, it's been a good while because it has seven parts. These things have a way of evolving. They get a life of their own. You ever have, work on a project that does that? Yeah. Kind of gets its own life. And then you begin to start, start, as soon as you start doing something, that's when the creative process begins, isn't it? In fact, it's too theoretical. You have an abstract idea. But when you start getting your hands on it, wait a minute, this, there's new possibilities. That's the creative process. And may I parenthetically mention that that's what God loves in you. He loves you to be a sub-creator. 
a co-creator, to take his resources that he's given and then to transmute them through your own personality as a gardener who gardens the things of God, just as it was from the beginning. They were there to garden, to cultivate, and that's an act of worship. And so whatever you do then, you're creating something that didn't exist. Gardens, when you go to a great garden, you don't find them in nature. Oh, nature is filled with great beauty and plants, but there's no garden as such. You see where I'm going with that? We create order and, and, and subdue it and multiply and create things. And I think this is what God's going to see us doing for all eternity. Remember how I define heaven? One way of describing it. See if any of you remember it. Oh, come on now. Endless creative activity without frustration to the glory of God. I want you to think of that for a minute. You will continue to create, sub-creator. You will continue to garden, but in the new creation where there is no world, no flesh, no devil, where there is no death, disease, sorrow, separation, sickness, that's a context where you, your cognitive capacity will be vastly enhanced, you will, your longevity will be eternal, and your capacity, I think, for pleasure, which was also lost at the fall, will be vastly increased. What will it be like that in the, in the physics of the new order of creation, a new realm of all things? What do you suppose it will be like? I can only imagine, but I cannot really name it. It's beyond my grasp. But I promise you this, it'll be more than worth your while. So as we live with faithfulness, so that's what wisdom's about. So as I've been speaking about wisdom, and then these, this is where uh, I headed in that series here. I'm not going to go into that much depth in this series, but I do want to just uh, talk about certain aspects of wisdom, of what it means, of what is wisdom, and how can we think it through. Now this is from my book, Conform to His Image, and this is the revised edition of it. So there are eight questions that I want us to explore together as we reflect together on what is wisdom, what's the nature of wisdom, how do we process it, and so forth. And so, first of all, I argue, and this is under what's uh, it's called um, the centrality of Christ. This is holistic spirituality, and so this was uh, chapter 17, in case you're interested. Some of you have a copy of the book, um, and it, an integrated life is where, what I've just been talking about, where everything matters. Everything's connected together, and everything centers around Christ at the, as the hub of the wheel, and then the other components then uh, find their, pro their, their proper places in alignment with that, you see. So this concept here, see if I can find it in, in this book here, there's a diagram here where we have a compartmentalized life where basically Christ is maybe there. You see him in there a little bit? But if it weren't for that one dot there, the only, the only, the only difference there, if, if you just covered that up, it would just be like everyone else. For all intents and purposes then, there's just a, fun, a strange uh, kind of a diminishment of life when he's a component, a compartment, and not the central. And thus, the, the real life I'm looking at is where he's the centrality, he is the center, and therefore all the facets of your life Find their proper orientation around that hub, and then all things matter, and everything is done from, by him and through him and to him. And in that context, then, we see life having a far more meaningful context. In fact, this is where uh, we had a chart, and this is a different chart, we modified it now, where you have these fundamental relationships, first these vertical uh, relationships with God and with ourselves, and then the horizontal relationships with the world, with believers, and then these various facets. The point of life, though, and wisdom is to really integrate every component of your day and your life and to do it as unto the glory of the Lord and to honor Christ. You see the concept? And you abide in him. Remember these three things that I've told you that you want to do when you get up in the morning? Love and gratitude is the first one. And then submit and depend. And de under depend, I always use these three phrases and see if anyone, if anyone remembers those. So first you want to, this day I'm going to trust the Father, I'm going to abide in the Son, Dennis has got it, and I'm going to walk by the Spirit. Don't forget those three, because that is a way of recalibrating, reorienting. And if you just carry that with you in your mind, 
You can summon that up in a conversation. Remember, we are capable of being, uh, or of thinking on two levels simultaneously, the spiritual and the physical, the material. And we can integrate. So while you're talking with someone, you can also be what? Praying for them. And you can be a pra- aware of God's presence in that, in that context. And so at any point, you can always summon up those three. What, is, what are they again? To trust the Father, to abide in the Son, and to walk by the Spirit. If, if you remember nothing from this session, I want you to remember that. And I want you not just to remember it, I want you to carry it with you today. I want you to seek to train yourself, to habituate yourself, because that's training in righteousness is, is habituation. And we know about that whole idea of neuroplasticity, neurons that fire together, wire together, and so you really rewire your mind, as it were, because of habitual practices that are good. As a result, this becomes second nature. It becomes like muscle memory, in this case, spiritual memory. So you summon it up. At any point, you can do this when you're driving, when you're talking to somebody. And it's bringing you back, centering again into what? Trust the Father, that's your essential issue. You can't understand the Father, but you can trust Him. And then you are to abide in the Son because He's in you and you are in Him. And then third, walk by the power of the Spirit. You're now keeping in step with the Spirit. You're actually choosing to consciously derive your power from Him And in doing so, as you walk by the Spirit, you are abiding in Christ, and therefore you're also then, you're going to be trusting the Father, and it'll express itself in what actions? Obedience. At the end, if you love me, what does he say you will do? Keep my commandments. There's a lot of things I don't want to do, but I know I need to do, you see. Because he doesn't tell me to to like everything he calls me to do, does he? Does he call you, tell you to like a lot of things. There's a lot of things you don't like to do. Tell me some things you don't like to do. What what immediately popped in your mind? I I didn't hear anything. Take out the garbage. Now, your mission, having said that, is this next time you take out the garbage, you're going to do it to the glory of God. I'm serious about that. You can do it. You take out, because you see, just as he's told us, that we are to love others even though we don't like some people. Because remember, he never commanded like each other like I I like you. That's that's something that you cannot just summon up. There's some people you just don't like. But he doesn't call us to like people. What does he call us to do? Love Love them. What does that mean? Love, remember what love is? The steady intention of your will toward another person's highest good. I want you to think about that. It's a volitional love. It's not a feeling or a mode of love. Consequently, then, you can choose to do the deeds of love even when the feelings are not present, can't you? And you can choose, and as I've said this multiple times before, but it bears repeating, you get to choose how you view your friend, your neighbor, your spouse. You can focus on those things that are endearing or annoying your call that's a choice now just as he's called us then to love him in all things even though we don't like all things love people and that even though we don't, he also calls us to love him in all tasks to which we are called you see including taking out the garbage because we can we can love him in the action even though we don't like doing it and at the point when you do that You now see, you receive it as from God, a task you're called to do, and then you execute it with excellence and with skill and with diligence to the glory of God. Do you see what you're doing now? So you may not like it, but you can choose to love him in it. And in doing so, it's doxological. Everything matters. Everything goes to the glory of God. So that's a simple thought. What else don't you like to do? (laughs) I don't like to pay taxes. I don't like to balance my, you know, the the bank account and all of those things. Don't like it at all. There's a lot of things I don't like to do. But he didn't ask me, what would you like? He says, what do you love? 
And ultimately, what are we to do? To love the Lord, our God, with all our minds, hearts, souls, minds, and strength, inside out. And also to love our neighbors another. And by the way, that's another activity that's all the time, not just in the morning or in the afternoon. When you, what are you going to do, love God? Just, I, I love him before I go to sleep. No, it's all day long, and your neighbor the same. And so it comes out of the heart. And that's why I'm saying the centrality of Christ is so absolutely critical. But to go back to where we were, though, I want to go back to this concept then of wisdom. And, uh, but I was unpacking that. So I see wisdom as the skill of, uh, in the art of living life with every area or facet under the dominion of God. And so as I see it then, it is the ability to use the best means at the best time, you see, to accomplish the best ends. It's not just doing the right thing, doing it the right way, at the right time, for the right reason, and the right power. You see, that's something very specific, and the Spirit guides you, but you gain skill through the practice of habituation as you do all things. And so it's a skill, and this is a critical uh, theme that we need to keep in mind, this idea of wisdom being a skill, because that's what the word chokhmah really means. Chokhmah, the Hebrew word for wisdom means skill. And I've told you this before, but who were the fabricators of the tabernacle? They're not well known but they were actually very critical uh, men in Israel's history. They were men, it says, who had a spirit of skill, of wisdom. Aholiab and Bezalel were the two. And they were given, and so the analogy is, they took raw material and by, through wisdom, shaped it and crafted it and turned it into something valuable and precious. You see the idea? They could take flax, and they could, uh, they could then uh, turn that into linen. You see, they, they would actually take material, and through practice, then, they would actually take this material, uh, tease it out, whatever needed to be done to perfect it and purify it, and then make linen, and then make the garments of the, of the priests, for example. Um, the idea of taking gold. And what would they do? You have the ore. What do you have to do? As a goldsmith, you have to, of course, Heat it up, you have to put it in a crucible. And as you know, then you purify it when the dross rises to the surface, and that's why we are shaped by suffering. To, to mention the name of one of my books, because uh, we are that raw material which is being purified through the adversity so that the uh, things that are of the flesh rise to the surface, the dross rises to the surface, and the more, mature, more you go through that process, the more pure you become, the more you begin to become reflecting the, mo the, the uh, goldsmith's uh, image in the molten material because he skims it off. You see the concept? So you are being shaped by the adversity of life. And that's a, a very real component. But I'm suggesting again then that you and I are like that. We are like precious material, but it needs to be actually purified and shaped and directed. And so they could take that gold and purify it and then hammer it out and make the actual uh, lampstand in the tabernacle with its calyx and corolla and the various stands and the branches. And it not only was something that fun was functional, what else did it have? It was beautiful. Your life then, not only to you to make things and to do them well, but make them beautiful. So everything you matter then has a functionality, a utility, but it also has an aesthetic, you see, because he wants us to do things well. Excellent. Now, how can you take out the garbage with panache? I don't know. But you can do it, though, and say, I, this is a task I received from you, and I'm putting it out here. And in fact, one of the times I did that with that mindset, sure enough, the guy from the garbage, the garbage truck comes by just at that moment. And I had an encounter with him that was absolutely astonishing, just at that moment. The timing couldn't have been more perfect. So the interesting thing then is that that did matter, you see. But even if there's not a person, you're doing it as unto the Lord. Whether others notice is not the issue. 
you're concerned about playing to the right audience. That's part of wisdom. So it's a skill then in the art of living life, every area under the dominion of God. And secondly, how do we pursue wisdom? It rests in the hands of the living God then. And so we cannot attain true wisdom. So we know then that wisdom comes from above, and it's the wisdom from above as opposed to the wisdom from below. And you remember that the profound distinction in James chapter 3. And as I describe it, I use, as you know, I use a lot of alliteration. In this case, I've got four C's. The wisdom from, of this world is cagey and conniving and crafty and cunning, you see. Um, my point is, that is, there is a wisdom, but it's a distortion of the true wisdom of God. It's a parasite. It's an ugly distortion, a counterfeit. But the true wisdom that comes from above is both pure and peaceable and yields good fruits. In other words, it's the life of Christ mediated in the life of the believer. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It is his life in your life, mediated through your own personality in a way that no one else can do. So that's really this idea of, of, of pursuing wisdom. Then what are the conditions of attaining wisdom? Well, true wisdom can be gained only by cultivating the fear of the Lord. And have we not talked about that of late? We've been talking about this idea, there's too little about the fear of God. And I think there's a terrible blunder that's been made because the scriptures are very clear about this being a major category um, that we need to bear in mind. We very rarely hear about it, but it's crazy because to selectively choose the bits we like, which is almost always going to be here, let's be honest about it. Wouldn't you prefer this list to that list? Or am I crazy? Very few people like to be broken and contrite and to tremble at his word. How many people then are astonished by the wholeness and awe of God and walk in absolute humility and dependence? Do you think many? Because remember that the fear of God is a spectrum. And as we see then, it's a spectrum that goes at the very least to a sense of absolute humility and the realization that you have nothing that wasn't given to you and that all things come from him. But then it can, as God mediates himself less and less, then it can be more like awe and dread and holy terror. And my point is, though, that is something that we see in the scriptures, and it's not actually developed as much as my view as it ought to be. So here, then, who will not fear him? Because, you see, he's transcendent, he's beyond us, but he's also imminent. And the reality of transcendence is evident from the created order. General revelation shows that. But, the, but general revelation could never reveal this. That the God who holds the cosmos together is the lover of your souls is something that Scripture had to reveal. And my, my point, though, is that both are equally true. And you t remember what I've told you before? Tell me what a man fears. And I'll tell you what he loves. Tell me what a man loves. I'll tell you what he fears. You see, they're, they're the flip side of that coin. There's a reciprocal relationship. So the fear of the Lord is to be cultivated. And what is the fear of the Lord? It's an attitude, as I just said, of awe and humility, recognizing our creaturehood and our need for complete dependence on in every activity. Then five, well, why have so few people developed this twin attitude of awe and humility? I think it's the temporal value system of the world in which we are tortured treated or taught in this world to treasure the temporal as if it's going to be eternal. And to look at the eternal as something you can postpone. I'll deal with that later on. Which means then you can miss your entire life, like a person misses a train or a plane. You can miss your entire life by, by waiting and waiting and waiting until you never gain wisdom and after a while you become kind of sedentary. There's an inertia um, that sets in, where you no longer even have the power to even make the choice. We hear about the frog and the kettle, you've all heard that phrase. But what happens when the frog, even if they've said, hey, you're in this boiling, you're in this water and it's heating up here, you better get out of here because you're going to die. And it realizes, but if it's been languishing too long in that kettle, what'll happen? It doesn't have the ability to get out anymore, you see. You can only get heated up so much until you lose your energy. 
And so uh, we have to jump out of that kettle is, is the idea. But you see, you get so accustomed to that. Remember what I said about people? Most men have flabby wills, sloppy thought lives, and anemic intentions. That's what we are. Very flabby wills. We don't aspire to that greatness to which we're called. We have sloppy thought lives. We tolerate and deal with and allow images in our minds that are unworthy of a child of the living God. And, and then we also have anemic intentions. We're not passionate about what our lives could be and knowing him. You see, uh, without passion, then you begin to diminish and you decline and you dissipate and you die. So this is why I say this treasuring, the th true wisdom is to treat things according to their true value. And that is what it's about. Well then, uh, what can enable us to reject the temporal value system? It's only cultivated by faith, I say. Believe in God in spite of appearances and circumstances. Biblical faith is to trust in God in spite of appearances and circumstances to the contrary. Does he tell you that you're dead to sin in Christ? If you're in Christ, does he tell you that you're alive to God and dead to sin? Does he say that? Do you feel dead to sin? He didn't ask you if you feel that way. He said, are you? You choose to reckon it as true and then you acknowledge it as such and live that way because you're now recalibrating and true faith is to actually believe what God says in spite of my experiences, in spite of my feelings, in spite of the narrative of this world. So this is why it's cultivated by faith, believing God in spite of appearances and circumstances. And so uh, going back to here then, um, the uh, last part then is, um, I think that got all, all eight of them, didn't uh, No, six of them, okay, that's six of them. Let me go to the next one here. Oh, this, that's the other, I, I, here we go. How do we grow in faith then is the next question. Well, our ability to trust God is directly proportionate to our knowledge of God. You want to, remember what I've said before, to know him, not just intellectually, but personally, experientially, and relationally. Brings us back to those four life-changing prayers of Paul in the spiritual renewal card. To know him is what those prayers are about. And our ability to trust him is really directly proportionate to that personal, that uh, experiential, relational knowledge. Then how can you increase your knowledge of God? And it rests in the fact that God is a person. And this concept then is very critical because that's where we go. Five things about uh, relationships, and then we'll go to our tables. Both people, for, for, for if it's, you're dealing with the fact that God's a person, five things are true. Number one, both people must be willing to get to know each other. Would you agree? Because if, for example, you want to know, pick somebody, anyone you want to know, somebody you would really love to, to get to know in this world. Um, so if you, for someone was really big in the crown, then it would be the Queen of England. And I promise you, she, you won't get to know her unless she chooses to allow you to know her. You see the concept here? That's true of anybody. And at the end of the day, you both have to have a reciprocal willingness. And the amazing thing is God wants us, love, wants us to know him because he knows us. So this is an amazing thought. Number two, both people must gain knowledge of each other, not just merely about each other. They have to have a knowledge of each other. You know what I'm talking about. It's one thing to know about facts about a, a person in history. It's another person to have known that person. What would it have been like to really know Lincoln personally and, and have an experiential kind? What is it like to know and walk with Jesus personally? In this context, you can do that. And um, so you have to have a, a knowledge of each other. And then third, there's got to be openness and acceptance and forgiveness in a relationship, does there not? Because otherwise, without that, there's no growth. You see, you cannot actually grow in a relationship with a person you cannot trust. So trust is implicit. You can, forgiveness is, by, is, is free and it's by grace, but trust is earned, you see? Trust is by works. So somebody burns you, you can forgive them, but that doesn't mean you're called to trust them anymore. But that can, but doesn't mean you want to be cynical or hard about it, because after a period of time giving them grace, it may be possible that the person grows and becomes trustworthy. You see the idea? But it's earned through action. And then the person becomes trustworthy. 
Um, so, it, so it is as well. The openness, acceptance, forgiveness are necessary. Uh, next, uh, the fourth one is time must be spent in communication. You're in, if you're not communicating, you're diminishing. And most marriages, as you well know, have a way of eroding and dissipating. The common ground dissipates. And unless you intentionally keep the common ground there, she has her interests in this area, you have yours there, and that's perfectly acceptable. But without common ground, though, that's another story. That's why I fear that many marriages are were so much about the kids that when the kids leave home, they're two strangers under the same roof. Big mistake, because they focused on the relationship that was only temporary with their kids as opposed to the relationship that's permanent. You see the concept? So the way you cultivate that is intentional acts of finding those areas of commonality and reinforcing them and develop, developing them once again, what, what initially brought you together. And finally, the relationship is developed in action, responses to the needs and desires of another. So with that in mind, then, here are the questions that I gave you last week that I'm giving you again this week. Because we didn't get that far, now we did. All right? So these are the questions. How would you define wisdom? We, we, we did that a little bit last time. But then we've now looked at these eight biblical keys for attaining wisdom. And then finally, how these five conditions. So I'm going to let you uh, have at it. It's around your tables, okay? Let's take a look and see. How did you do on these three questions? I was telling uh, my group on the... Uh, I, I now do this little Zoom thing with that. That becomes my table. That's my group. So um, with that, we, I mentioned to them that the second and third questions in particular can be used as diagnostic tools. Uh, by that, I meant, I meant this. When you go back to this question of the second question, what is wisdom and what are the keys, these eight, you could use it. Where am I weak on this one? Okay, do, am I pursuing wisdom, you see? Do I have a grace? Where am I connecting with the fear of God? You see, how does that energize and animate my life? Um, and so the issue of the value, where is my value system? You see, so these are diagnostic tools that you can actually use as well. How am I growing in faith? And so my knowledge, how am I moving in that area? And then I also mentioned in that group, in my group, that um, the third question is also a diagnostic question because you can use those five areas to diagnose how am I doing with my spiritual uh, walk. So once again, as we saw them before, you have to be willing to know each other. Well, how, am I, how is my willingness? God has expressed his willingness very clearly. He paid an awful price to make it possible for us to know him. So his willingness is there. The problem is we're the ones who aren't willing. Uh, reminds me again of those old cars Remember the bench, bench seats in the, in the old cars where you didn't have them as they now are? It was just one big bench. You remember what I'm talking about, those old cars? And the guy's driving the car and his wife's on the right. He says, George, you know, we're not as close to one another as uh, we used to be. Because she's sitting, used to, I used to be right next to you. He says, I didn't move, the guy says. And he didn't. He's, be, he, he's been behind the steering wheel all along. I didn't move. Who moved? You moved. And you're complaining? You see the point there? You're the one who moved away. And that's the point. I've always been there, is the analogy. You're the one who has not the willingness. So that has a diagnostic. What's your willingness? Or secondly, um, how am I doing in terms of knowing more about the person, and not just about them, but reality? And I mentioned these uh, life-changing prayers in my group again. And we've seen this because all four of these prayers have to do with the eyes of your heart being enlightened. He's talking here about a spirit of wisdom and of revelation. This is something that is actually uh, remarkable because what does that mean? The, what does it mean that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened? Interesting image, the eyes of your heart, you see. Or uh, so have, that you may know, and the word know, knowing is the word epigenosco, have a real knowledge, a personal knowledge, an experiential knowledge, a relational knowledge. And then further, he goes and speaks about his desire for them to actually be strengthened with God's power and actually have a knowledge to know the love of Christ, <laughs> which surpasses knowledge. You can have a kind of knowledge that goes beyond the ordinary head knowledge. You see where I'm going? So that becomes, and that's, again, the other two prayers are very much along that line. 
So suggesting that then brings us back to this concept of, all right, then how am I doing on that, on that idea of uh, knowing, each, knowing him? Where, so it's a diagnostic. Third question is a diagnosis. How open am I to him, to his correcting voice, to the convicting of the spirit, that quiet, quiet voice that prompts but never pushes? So you, I believe, can train yourself to begin to listen to the quiet prompts of the spirit. And as you do that, after a while, you train yourself and you can begin to hear it in more nuanced ways. When he's prompted you, don't say that, or do this, or whatever. You see, the spirit might bring a person to mind. And as you respond to that, you then become more skillful in that process, you see. And how am I doing in my communication? How am I doing in my action? So all five are diagnostic. What are your thoughts? How did, what conclusions did you all reach at your tables as you came up with your questions? I'm really asking this question. <laughs> yeah. You spoke about then, yeah. Uh, how wisdom as being a skill. A skill yes, skill. wisdom is skill. Mm -hmm. really got in depth in that Did you? Yeah. Isn't it interesting to look at a skilled musician or an artisan, a craftsman? I watched a video, for example. Um, sometimes I'll see these crazy YouTube things, just out of curiosity, how things are made. Sometimes, you know, it's interesting. And this one guy, it showed how he conceived of a particular kind of guitar, and then he gradually brought it into being. Which is an amazing thought, by the way. Stop and think about that. Because you are more than an intentional being, you're also in an imaginative being. Unlike all other beings, a species uh, in this world, you alone can imagine something and bring it into being. You see, that's an amazing thought, so that we can have an intention and then be able to actually bring it into reality. So when you see great skill in singing or whatever, I happen to be seeing with my wife Ken Burns' series on jazz again. I saw it before my own, but then I thought, you know, it'd be fun to share it again, because you can't remember all these things, there's so much detail. How many of you have seen that, that series? It's about, what is it, maybe six or seven, or something about six, eight. You ought to see it. I've strong, if, if, I don't know if you like jazz, but it would be an interesting thing to understand how it came and what it's about, and it really is a unique music that didn't exist before. It was invented here in America, actually, really in New Orleans, and then spread, especially Chicago and New York. But what's fascinating about that is the skill with some of these people, with proficiency that you see a Louis Armstrong with that trumpet, and then that scat singing that he invented that nobody had ever, ever done before. And, and then became, so everyone tried to imitate that sound. You hear that sound, you wanna be like him. You see this concept here? Um, uh, the, all these wonderful, skillful musicians who only continued to develop those skills as they, as they grew. You see the concept? What is it that you admire? Um, what about excellence in construction? Or ex you see, that's a skill. It's a set of where you do it with integrity and excellence because everything that you do then matters, you see. That's what I'm suggesting. There's no sacred secular dichotomy. Did something else come to your mind in, in your time around the table that you'd like to share? There's a difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. Yes, the worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. That contrast that I drew in that chart with all the cagey, cunning, conniving, crafty, you know, there's just, uh, it's intri intriguing how people confuse the two. And I think as we look at the wisdom of the word, it reveals the error in the wisdom of the world. You refer to that as a parasite. Yes, I think of, I think of, ev of, of evil as a parasite on the good. It's a counterfeit, it's a distorted love. So what you have, evil is not so much a thing in itself. It's, a, it's actually, it's a distortion of a good, you see. It's, as Augustine put it, it's disordered loves. So that evil cannot exist without good? Yes, evil cannot exist without good, and evil is not a thing in itself, you see. It, it's just like darkness is not a thing in itself, it's an absence of something. It's an absence of light, 
you see? And uh, so also this whole idea of, uh, so that darkness and cold is an absence of heat. It's not a thing in itself, it's an absence of something. You see the concept? But I'm suggesting that what we all, because we, we are image bearers even though fallen, even so, then you um, still have this capacity in you. But the problem will be, though, that, you, that, if, that evil is going to be always at the door, it lurks at the door. Even as a believer, you have us pull a choice. Yes? One of the things that we talk about is the concept that wisdom is the proper application of knowledge, in the sense that you could have a scientist with a tremendous understanding of the cell but still not see the creator. And you can have that hourly wage person that took what knowledge they had, and by the time they retire, they've got great family relationships, and they're able to retire comfortably financially because what knowledge they had, they applied wisely. So there's not a correlation necessarily between having intelligence or knowledge That's right. and having wisdom. That's right. So that, wisdom with what knowledge that's a good word. Do you all hear that, I hope? It, that's a good word, and that's a good way to round this out. So, Dennis, it's, it's time for us to do that.